Madison says that a Bill of Rights would be unnecessary or dangerous. Unnecessary because the Constitution itself is a Bill of Rights. And by constraining con Congress's power and the President's power, it gives the federal government no authority to infringe the retained, unalienable, natural rights of conscience and speech and other basic liberties. And dangerous because Madison said if you write down certain rights in a Bill of Rights, people might wrongly assume that if a right isn't written down, it's not protected. And because the framers believe that we have certain unalienable rights that come from God or nature, not from government, it was dangerous to try to confine them to a definite list. But because of the heroic protests of the anti-federalists, led by the three gentlemen that you can see just outside here in Signers Hall, uh, George Mason, author of the Virginia Declaration of Rights, Edmund Randolph of Virginia and Elbridge Gerry of Massachusetts, those anti-federalists refused to sign the Constitution because it contained no Bill of Rights and the state ratifying conventions demanded a Bill of Rights. So Congress sets the uh, 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 Bill of Rights um, out for uh, ratification because James Madison changes his mind in the face of this popular protest and on September 25th, 1780. Nine, the Congress proposes 12 amendments to the Constitution. You can see one of the 12 original copies of the Bill of Rights just outside this room, right past Signers Hall, and our first panelists will talk about the provenance of that document. And what's so interesting is that it contains not 10 amendments, but 12. The original First Amendment says that uh, there has to be one representative in Congress for every 30,000 inhabitants. If that had passed, there'd be something like 4,000 people in Congress today. The original Second Amendment says that Congress can't raise its salary without an intervening election. That was finally ratified as the 27th Amendment in 1992. So our First Amendment was their third, and it was sent out to the states with a beautiful preface. And I'm going to read that preface now because it'll inspire us for our discussions. Here is the preface to the original Bill of Rights. The conventions of a number of the states, having at the time of their adopting the Constitution, expressed a desire in order to prevent misconstruction or abuse of its powers, that further declaratory and restrictive clauses should be added, and as extending the ground of public confidence in the government will best ensure the beneficent ends of its institution, resolved by the Senate and House, that the following articles be proposed. So, those um, amendments are uh, proposed on September 25th, 1789, and on December 15th, 1791, 225 years ago today, Virginia becomes the 10th of 14 states to approve 10 of the original 12 amendments, giving the Bill of Rights the necessary two-thirds majority for ratification. And that is why we are celebrating Bill of Rights Day on December 15th, and that's why we are so thrilled uh, to celebrate the 225th anniversary of the Bill of Rights today. We have a blockbuster lineup for you of four spectacular authors about the Bill of Rights. Here are the constitutional feasts that you have in store. We're gonna begin with a discussion of America's founding documents with historian Stephen uh, Puglio and uh, former museum director Nancy Moses. Then we'll talk about the Second Amendment with former National Rifle Association President David Keene. We'll talk about the death penalty with the law professors John Bessler, Carol Steiker, and Jordan Steiker, and we'll end this wonderful festival. Um, I, I'm so looking forward to this. I'm gonna have the chance to interview my great constitutional law teacher and dear friend, Akhil Amar, about his new book about the Constitution. So it's gonna be great, and I'm so glad that you're joining us. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and now, finally, I will just end with a brief plug to you and our wonderful C-SPAN viewers. If you have not yet uh, checked it out, download the Interactive Constitution. You can find it online at constitutioncenter.org, or you can download it in the App Store. And as you're watching these beautiful panels, follow along. Go to the Interactive Constitution, click on the amendment in question. When uh, uh, David Keene is talking about the Second Amendment, you can click on the Second Amendment. There you will find the two leading liberal and conservative scholars of the Second Amendment, nominated by the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society, Nelson Lund and Adam Winkler, describing what they agree about and what they disagree about. And you can do that as well for the Eighth Amendment and for all of the beautiful Bill of Rights amendments that we're talking about today 
at the Interactive Constitution at constitutioncenter.org. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our first panel, Stephen Puglio, Nancy Moses, and Charles Cullen. Thanks so much. Have a great day. And happy birthday, Bill of Rights. Yes, here's your book. <laughs> You're in the right place. Hello. Greetings. I'm uh, Charles Cullen. I'm the interim president and CEO of the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. I, I'm a legal historian and have great interest in these documents and in the subject of their protection, their security, and their veneration even. Um, and we, I'm going to ask Nancy and Steve to tell you a little bit about their backgrounds and what led them to write their books. Nancy? I'm a former museum director. My, the museum that I was a director of is right down the street. Um, it's called the Philadelphia History Museum. And when I got done with that job, um, I became very curious in why museums have so much stuff they, the public never gets to see. So I wrote a book about that. Um, and each chapter was on a different topic. When I got to the end of that book, there was one more topic to write about, and I decided to write about something that had been stolen from a Jewish family during World War II. Now, as a museum director, you've got access to other museum directors, so I figured I'd just call up someone who I knew had one of those objects, and they'd let me go and see it. Well, they wouldn't. I tried dozens of museums, and nobody would let me see an object that I knew had had a hole in its provenance that corresponded to the years of World War II. So I thought, that's what I want to write about. <laughs> Holocaust art. I was angry. Then I, but what happened was that I decided to put that into a broader context and look at um, a number of objects, all different kinds, that had been stolen during times of stress in those countries and that had eventually made its way, their way back home. So I was writing this book and I thought, oh, I'm going to write a series of true crime stories set in museums, you know, sort of like, I don't know, um, <laughs> Agatha Christie. But the more I wrote, the more the book started writing itself. And it became not only a series of true crime stories, but also about ethics and law and history. And that's how this book, Stolen, Smuggled, Sold, came about. It's a, a very well-written book. And one chapter is on the North Carolina copy of the Bill of Rights, which we'll come back to in a few minutes. Uh, Steve. <coughs> Tell us about your book. Thanks, Charles. And thank you for about having yourself. me, by the way. Um, my wife and I came here uh, yesterday from Boston. And I know there's always a good rivalry between Boston and Philadelphia, not just the Patriots and Eagles, but where it all began. You know, So we always have that friendly rivalry. So I appreciate you having me here. Um, <laughs> American Treasures is the story, also has its roots in um, World War II. And it's about the original declaration, the original Constitution, the original copies of the Gettysburg Address and several other documents that were moved to Fort Knox uh, in the aftermath of Pearl Harbor for safekeeping. And uh, I began that story with that piece. I had read a small item in a magazine article about that relocation. And I've done a lot of reading on World War II, a lot of writing on World War II, a lot of <laughs> teaching on World War II, and had never heard that story. And that movement to Fort Knox then began the largest relocation of precious American documents for safekeeping in American history, when the Library of Congress moves about 5,000 boxes of other precious documents to various inland repositories to be out of the way of potential German bombers, saboteurs, real concerns in Washington at that point of an attack on Washington, DC. So that's one thread or one narrative um, parallel track of this, of this book. And then as I was doing it, I said to myself, wow, why are these documents so important? What gave uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt 
the impetus to do this kind of saving and protecting and pre preserving. And the Library of Congressman, Librarian of Congress, Archibald McLeish, why did he feel such a strong stewardship for these documents? So I realized I had to go back and look at the creation of these documents and the different efforts to save them throughout American history. So this book takes you back to 1776, to 1787, to 1814 when the Declaration of the Constitution get moved out of Washington, D.C. Uh, in a linen sack on the back of a wagon when the British burn Washington, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it works in a braided narrative kind of way all the way up to 1952 uh, when the documents are finally transferred from the Library of, Library of Congress to the National Archives. I, I found your organization, uh, the structure of your book, really interesting. And listening to you tell how you got the idea to do the book, uh, explains to me uh, your organization better. Uh, and it leads me to, to have some questions that I'll ask you in a few minutes. Um, you, you write about the Constitutional Convention and the creation of these original charter documents, the founding documents. Uh, but then you, you, your next chapter may be in, in Washington in 1938 or in 1942 or well, I think you jump you, you, you do go right to the aftermath of Pearl Harbor mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it goes back and forth and I found that to be a really good device um, to think about the importance of these documents and your book seems to me to be a, a book about um, the protection of charter documents, are valuable documents in our history. Uh, and Nancy's book uh, seems to me to be about what happens when they aren't protected. Uh, I mean, there's, uh, it, so it's really, the two books are, are well placed together in terms of thinking about security of documents, uh, the importance of documents. Um, I, I'd like to ask you about, uh, I mean, you, you, you're saying that you started with an interest in World War II. Uh, I'd like both of you to, uh, to talk a little bit about why you think these documents are, why we, why we built a shrine for these documents and why we value, the, in the case of North Carolina, which I'd like before you, uh, trying to think how to get into this is, uh, um, let's, let's talk about the, Bill of, the North Carolina Bill of Rights first, uh, because this is Bill of Rights Day, um, and, and Nancy has written about the recovery of North Carolina's lost copy, and I'd like her to talk about it. I'd like you to tell us that story, and a little bit about how they, uh, how they got it back, the difficulties, the, the time span, and how they proved it was theirs. This actually is a National Constitution Center story because part of it happened here, actually before the building was built. Um, so in, at the end of the Civil War, the Union troops enter Raleigh, North Carolina, which is the capital city. Everybody knows the war is about to, to end, but the people in North Carolina are terrified because it's Sherman, and Sherman has destroyed the South, right? So the troops come into North Carolina, and they're set up, a group of them um, are set up to surrounding the Capitol building in North Carolina. And when they leave the city, the Capitol building has been ransacked and many important documents have disappeared, including the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights had been folded up four times. It had been docketed when it arrived from Washington, D.C. Uh, no, New York, sorry. It, uh, it, at the time, it, uh, George Washington was in New York um, when the Bill of Rights were, was put together, and so it, it came to North Carolina and the clerk wrote on the back of it the day it arrived and that it was in North Carolina's Bill of Rights. This happened in every state in the Union. Somebody recorded when the document arrived on the back of the document. So North Carolina's Bill of Rights 
leaves with the Union troops. It ends up in Tippecanoe, Ohio, <laughs> and then is purchased by a guy for five bucks who takes it and hangs it on the wall of his office. Right? It's hanging there, and so over time it fades, right? Because it's on vellum. And when he dies, it passes on to his wife, who hangs it in her senior citizen's home, where she is. And it, is, and it eventually is turned over to, their, to the family's daughters. What's interesting about this is that nor all this time, it's over 100 years, North Carolina knows where their Bill of Rights is. They knew it was hanging on the wall there? They knew it was hanging on the wall there. But because, it, because some smart guy had, uh, over time, had thought, ah, oh, money, we can sell North Carolina's Bill of Rights back to North Carolina. It's illegal to steal documents, government documents. But nobody, they thought nobody was paying much attention. What they didn't realize was how much North Carolina loved that Bill of Rights. They were the only um, state that refused to sign the Constitution without a Bill of Rights. And they loved it so much that they refused to make it a commodity and refused to buy it back. So the, girl, so the daughters get the document. They go to an antique dealer and they say, we've got this great thing we want to sell. They don't know if they're able to sell it. Oops, sorry. And so what they do is they find an antique dealer and that antique dealer finds another antique dealer and pretty soon somebody has purchased a copy of the Bill of Rights and they're out to make as much money as they can. This is um, an antique dealer, actually, who appeared here in Philadelphia many times at the antique show. Mm -hmm. So he was well known in Philadelphia. So this is about what period of time? I mean, it was on the wall in offices and the yeah. This is around. Home. This is well. This is around um, 2000, a little bit later. When did they first offer it back to North Carolina for sale? They offered it the first time around the turn of the 20th uh, 20th century. Around that's what um, I thought. Yeah. yeah. And then it was offered again in the 30s. So uh, uh, several times yeah. throughout the, the 20th century. Yes. Uh, it was offered for sale. And North Carolina um, refused to buy it because it was theirs and they didn't want to make it a commodity. Did they ever threaten legal action? Uh, and, they and was could it not, clear? actually that's a good uh, question, Charles. They, they couldn't because the, the um, seller was all, all, always hidden behind a, a dealer see, or, an, or yeah. an agent that represented the seller. Okay. So they didn't know who had it. Yeah. At least that's what they said. Um, so it so ends up in Philadelphia. It ends up in Philadelphia. Um, because, with a dealer. With a dealer who tries to sell it to the National Constitution Center, right before the <coughs> Constitution Center opens. <coughs> and the head of the Constitution Center, Joe Torsella, and the <coughs> general counsel meet with this guy and they say, well, we'd love to have the Bill of Rights. And the dealer says, well, we even have a better deal for you. You can have it for free because we have found a wealthy, two wealthy donors who would like a tax deduction and they are willing to buy this Bill of Rights and give it to you for free. This is not unusual. Often people with um, very valuable things donate them to institutions to receive the tax deduction. Mm -hmm. So that's not unusual. So what happens with the general counsel and Joe Torsella is that the word gets back to, the, gov to um, the governor of North Carolina that the National Constitution Center has been offered North Carolina's copy of the Bill of Rights. And within a day or so, the FBI is on the case. They come to Philadelphia and they say to the head of the Constitution Center, you got to help us get it back from North Carolina. So the FBI arranges a sting. <coughs> True story. In one of the law offices here in Philadelphia, um, Dilworth? Dilworth, my husband's sitting back there. He <laughs> said so it's a Dilworth, and he's a lawyer. Um, so he said it's a Dilworth law firm. And so what happens is that um, the 
the um, agent for the guy who owns the Bill of Rights brings it to the office. Everybody looks over this document. It's all faded and sort of nasty looking spots on it, but they, they're in awe of it because it's a Bill of Rights. And then the FBI goes crashing through <laughs> and pushes everybody against, against the wall, confiscates the document, and flies it back to North Carolina. Seven years in court yeah. to get this document actually legally back to the North Carolina. So they got it back without having to, to buy it. To buy it, uh, that's right. <clears throat> that's certainly a, a, an interesting story and it, it has some relevance for the copy that's in, in the exhibit room. I hope you all go see. Uh, there's some question about whose it is, but let's come back to that in a, in a few minutes. Uh, Steve, you, you, you write about the elaborate efforts to uh, protect these charters of freedom, including the Bill of Rights, uh, that, that is, is the final one that was ratified, uh, belongs to the federal government. Uh, tell us a, 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 in, in brief, if you can, I mean, there were so many stories about what happened to them and to protect them. I guess the greatest one is World War II, but there were some others. But could you, could you give us a little detail about that uh, and the Fort Knox, William, the Washington Lee, the, uh, uh, some sure. of that. Uh, sure. Give us a, a, a story about protecting them during wartime. Yeah, so I think the two most dramatic periods in American history, both wars, the War of 1812, when the original declaration and the original constitution, and when I say original, I mean the engrossed on parchment copies of those documents. The one that's uh, now in the National Archives. Right? That's correct. Um, when they are moved out of Washington, D.C., when the British burn Washington. So a State Department clerk by the name of Stephen Pleasanton, um, very quick thinking, takes those two documents, rolls them up, stuffs them in a linen sack, uh, throws them in the back of a wagon, um, and moves them first just a couple of miles from D.C. and realizes then that might be too close because the British are coming and they're destroying the whole city. Uh, then the next morning gets up and moves them 35 miles to Leesburg, Virginia and stores them in an abandoned farmhouse. So your original engrossed copies of the Declaration and Constitution that are now at the archives are in this farmhouse uh, along with hundreds of other documents. And I think it's interesting that Pleasanton does this in defiance of the Secretary of War at the time, the Secretary of War, the War Department, the State Department, very close by, the Secretary of War sees Pleasanton, you know, packing up these documents. And he asks him why, and, and Pleasanton said, because the British are, are, are coming again in 1814, and they're going to burn Washington. The, the so, documents were uh, in the possession of the State Department correct. at that time, they were at, weren't they? Yes. And I mean, they so, didn't come to the archives until the 1950s. Correct. So the Secretary, I think a lot of people don't know that. I right. mean, they, they, so they, they had a, a kind of an ambulatory existence until the 50s. Well, they go to the State Department, they go to the Library of Congress, and right. then they go to the, the archives. Right. But, right. So the Secretary of War says, why are you moving these documents uh, in 1814? And Pleasanton says, because the British are coming. And Secretary of War says, they're not coming to Washington, D.C. They're interested in Baltimore and only Baltimore. There's no need to move these. Uh, and so Pleasanton does it in defiance of that and saves them during the War of 1812. And then during the, as I said, during World War II, um, great fears in Washington, D.C. Of, of an attack uh, on D.C. after Pearl Harbor. Uh, and a year before, so in the fall of 1940, FDR and Librarian of Congress Archibald MacLeish start planning, even though the U.S. has not entered the war yet, start planning the move of these documents and many, many other precious documents that are in the Library of Congress. They see what's happening in Europe. They see that millions of British documents have been incinerated during the Blitz, the Battle of Britain. They see that the Nazis are destroying millions of books, manuscripts, primary source documents throughout Europe, mostly by Jewish writers, but also other kind of non-Aryan documents, if you will. And so there's this great fear. They, f they feel the strong stewardship for these original documents. And so they start way back in 1940, McLeish says to his staff, I need you to go out and assess and catalog everything we have that's utterly irreplaceable uh, and that is 
essential to the operation of American de democracy. And they go out and they, and they come up with six categories. They basically triage these documents. And category one are the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, uh, the Gettysburg Address, the Articles of Confederation, uh, and several others are in that top category. The Bill of Rights is already at the National Archives at this point. The Library of Congress does not have it. Category two are things like the notes from the Constitutional Convention, uh, the journals of the Continental Congress, uh, the President's Papers, Washington's Diaries, those kinds of things, all the way down to six. And in the spring of 41, so about seven months before Pearl Harbor, the Library of Congress spends about uh, 700 volunteers and staffers spend about 10,000 hours uh, gathering, <laughs> assessing, cataloging, and packing about 5,000 boxes of documents that they hold. And after uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, McLeish had asked Treasury Secretary Henry Morgenthau, can we use Fort Knox? Uh, and originally he wants to use Fort Knox for all of the documents. And Morgenthau gets back to him and says, you can use a small section of the gold bullion depository, but there's tons of gold bullion in that depository, so I can give you 60 cubic feet which is about the size of a freezer. Um, and so McLeish has to make this decision which documents are going to Fort Knox. And so the ones that go uh, are the Declaration, the Constitution, two copies of the Gettysburg Address, Lincoln's second inaugural, the copies of the Articles of Confederation, the Library of Congress's copies of the Gutenberg, copy of the Gutenberg Bible, and one British document, the Magna Carta from 1215, um, that the U.S. was on display at the 1939 World's Fair in New York City. The British then asked us to hold on to it for safekeeping when war breaks out in Europe. And McLeish makes the determination that that document is just as precious and needs to be saved. And also thought it would be ironic and funny to Thomas Jefferson for the Declaration and the Magna Carta to be moved in the same uh, train that drove out to Louis, uh, Louisville and put, placed into Fort Knox. The other 5,000 boxes of documents go to university repositories, University of Virginia at Charlottesville, Washington Lee University in Lexington, uh, VMI in Lexington, and Denison University in Granville, Ohio. They move there. The documents need to be close enough for the Library of Congress staffers to examine them while they're in hiding, and, and they also need to be in places that, where humidity is not an issue, where um, uh, potential uh, atmospheric you know, conditions are not an issue, where mites and rodents and termites can't get to them, all of that. So they, they visit about 60 separate repositories uh, you know, to kind of figure out where to go, and they, and they decide on those four. And then eventually, they move, them to, they move out of VMI because it's considered a little bit more humid than they thought. And so they, they leave them in three repositories mm -hmm. from basically winter, spring of 42, when they all get moved in complete secrecy, by the way, nobody knows about it, till the fall of 44, so three or four months after D-Day, there's very little fear of an attack on the American mainland at that point, and the documents come out of hiding and are returned to the Library of Congress. They, uh, let's, let's jump ahead to, to when, uh, you know, like 10 years later, uh, these, it's decided that these all should be in the National Archives, which wasn't built until 1934. Um, the State Department had had these, a lot of these, the presidential papers, maybe not those founding documents, but the State Department had a lot of the things that ended up in the Library of Congress, or there, was, there were transfers made after, in the 20th century, when people began to uh, know how to better care for these kinds of things. Uh, but I, I'm interested in our, our talking a little bit about something that, um, that originated in, in my thinking from a book by Pauline Mayer, who wrote about the, the fact that we have built uh, in, in, the, in the 50s, but then again, as you write about, um, at the turn of this century, 2000 to 2003 or so, the the, the, the so-called shrine, and, and that's what it's called, uh, in the, the rotunda of the National Archives. Uh, it was shut down for a year or two, and, and, and uh, new work was done to protect the, the documents and, and to encase them in a certain way. But you point out that a million people a year go and look at it. 
But as I think about that and think about the North Carolina story <laughs> for the Bill of Rights, uh, it seems to me, uh, at least it's, it's worth discussing and thinking about, um, and that is this. Uh, it, it strikes me that starting with Pleasanton, maybe not starting with him, but you started with him, uh, you know, war, the, there, there was concern by people who were caring for these documents, who were their protectors, wherever they were, uh, to really protect them and make sure they were okay. In the case of North Carolina, uh, they didn't have it, uh, and they they were offered it for money, uh, which they didn't they didn't come forth with the money to buy it back. Uh, and then we jump to the to to after World War II, uh, when we start thinking about a shrine, and we've created one. I don't know of any other country in the world where their founding documents are venerated the way ours are by the public. And I think it's debatable that this public veneration of the documents uh, uh, didn't come about until after World War II. And I think it carries, I could argue, although you might disagree with me and I, I might lose the argument, but I would argue that if North Carolina had really wanted their Bill of Rights, in the early half, first half of the 20th century, they would have fought for it. They would have bought it or whatever. Uh, so I think it, it, was, it was after World War II. And I think even the Cold War has something to do with it. Uh, when we began to think that these documents uh, deserved or merited the veneration we now give them. Uh, what do you think about that? I mean, what's your reaction to that observation? Well. Um, has anyone been to the National Archives recently and seen the way those documents are presented? Yes, I have. It's very theatrical. Yes, I know that's, that's part of my, my point. Yeah, so you walk in and it's dark and quiet and everybody says, Hush. It's a shrine. That's it's right. a shrine. It's a, shrine. It's a temple. It, it's, it's a shrine. It's a temple. It's a shrine. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, that the spirit of the, the country, mm -hmm. because we are such a diverse people, mm -hmm. need those iconic documents preserved as a shrine, mm -hmm. kind of to unite us as a people. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, that, that that is part of the ethos of our country. So we have, yeah. we have developed that ethos as a country um, and as a, 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 an admirable device to bring us together unlike other countries that don't venerate the documents the way they do. I mean, I don't know if, if, if London did anything to protect the, the Magna Carta during World War II. Yeah, they did. The, the British do move documents. They, they move things out. To right. mines and things like that. But, but, I but, think, I think, but it's displayed, isn't it? Excuse me, but yeah. I, I, I mean, I, okay. I, just, I think the Magna Carta is in the, or in the old British library. It was, it was on display right in the same room with letters from the Beatles and things. I yep. mean, there's no shrine, it's just there. Right. As a, a, so there's not that same veneration. I think that's right. I think, I mean, some, I agree with most of what's been said. I think, keep in mind, America's, ours is the first constitutional republic that literally can trace its founding back to a single document, right. the Declaration of Independence. That is unique. Um, so I think that we've kind of realized that from the beginning. And you're right, it is a shrine think about what these documents are. So they're certainly artifacts, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're protected, they're in humidity proof cases, they're in atmospheric proof cases. You can, the National Archives has computer, digit, digit, digital kind of computer that can monitor inch by inch the condition of these parchments. Right, so they're right. certainly artifacts. But to Nancy's point, they're symbols as well. Very strong symbols of the founding of the country and of what does unite us, which is in large part our history in those documents. And three, right, they're working documents. If you, if you think about it, the Declaration of Independence, and I would say we could trace our, the kind of principles or the underpinnings of our democracy back to a single paragraph, right? We hold these truths to be self-evident, right. that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creators with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. We can, that, paragraph is part of every discussion, 
It's part of every debate. Mm -hmm. It's part of every mm -hmm. political discussion in some way, either explicitly or implicitly. We don't always get it 100% perfect, but it's in the discussion. And the Constitution, I mean, the Constitution is part of our lives on a daily basis. Every time you hear a newscaster say, does Congress have enough votes to override a presidential veto? Right. Who's going to control the Senate in the next election? You know, those, it's part of our life on a daily basis. So think about what these documents are. Artifacts, symbols, and kind of a blueprint to the way we run our government and our society. So they're really, I think, that's, you bring that all together, that's why people feel that need for stewardship. Thank you, thank you. Well, I, I, that's, I agree with everything you're saying, and, and, but I observe that none of that would change if the documents were lost. I, yeah. if, if, if they were destroyed, if they were destroyed, none of what you say would change. Uh, so I, I, I guess my point, and it's not something I'm trying to push, but I'm thinking that, <laughs> it's, that if, it's if not? Uh, uh, of course, <laughs> but uh, I, I guess uh, it's worth thinking about the, the importance of them as, a, as objects that we, that we venerate physically, uh, as, as opposed to, this center is here, for a similar purpose, but it's here without those documents. I mean, we, we can study, venerate the Constitution uh, through the things that we're doing today and that happen here all the time, every day, uh, without having the documents. I love the documents. Look, I, I, I was a documentary, I was the editor of the papers of Thomas Jefferson for, for a period of time. I, I love these documents and what they mean and, and Nancy's story about uh, how North Carolina use documentary uh, research uh, and the document itself to look on the back, the docketing, you know, the, the editing of documents can produce a lot of information about those documents that, that is lying but, but in Charles, there. Charles, I think, I think um, you, can venerate, you can venerate the documents without the documents, but there's something about being in the room with yep. something that Thomas Jefferson touched. Yep. It is irreplaceable, that experience. Oh, I, I share that feeling I, I about it. Uh, and, and, and I think, it, I mean, if a million people a year go through, it says something about the documents. It also says something about our culture, about, uh, you know, and, and my, my thoughts, and I, I'm, I'm not going to write a book about this, but I, 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 and I think Pauline Mayer got into this a little bit in her book about how our reaction to World War II to communism, to the, the continuing threat to our government and our way of life, uh, led us to, to think that, to, to come around these documents, the way we come around other things, around the table at Thanksgiving, around the Christmas tree Absolutely. at Christmas, and things like that. So I think it is a device that we have embraced and come up with. Uh, I, I could use derisive terms, but I, I don't feel derisive about it. I, I think it's a good thing. but. Uh, it's just inter inter interesting to me as an historian to think about uh, the, the changing attitudes toward the documents as I read your books, as I read history, and uh, <coughs> when these things became uh, important or so important as objects. I mean, they were really important to people who were taking care of them. But I think the, you know, the farmer in Virginia or in Ohio or wherever um, or the merchant in, in Lexington, Virginia, uh, might have known about it, might have thought this was a good thing, might not have known about it, you, you know, some of it was done in secrecy, but I, I don't think there was the thought that, you know, this becomes now a hallowed hall because it had these documents in them. I so, so I might disagree with that. Um, think about this. There's one, these documents I said that came out of hiding from Fort Knox uh, in September, of 44. There was one exception. The Declaration of Independence comes out of hiding uh, on April 13th of 1943, the 200th anniversary of Jefferson's birth, when um, the Jefferson Memorial um, opens, yeah. it opens, the dedication of the Jefferson Memorial. FDR thinks at this point in 43, it's been a real slog of a war. We've been at war for 16 months, whatever, uh, and that to boost the morale of the American people, having the original copy of the Declaration on display under 24-hour Marine Guard uh, would be something that would be helpful to the people. Mm -hmm. And so he brings it out of hiding, secret, its secret hiding place, Fort Knox, for a week. And thousands of Americans um, 
visit this visit this mini shrine, um, you know, at the at the uh, Jefferson Memorial right. to to come and see it. Now, part of it might have been the war years, as you say, that that kind of gave us that patriotic feeling or fervor or or you know that connection to the documents. I think, mm -hmm. but I think also. As Nancy says, when you see these documents, the originals, or you touch other documents that you work on, that there is a feeling, of this, this venerating feeling. And, and the example I always use is, when you go to that shrine and a million people go through that shrine to see documents, think about that. that that's pretty un, um, amazing. When you go there, even the kids, my wife is a principal of a, a K through eight parochial school uh, in the Boston area. And when you're the husband of the principal, you chaperone lots of things and you're involved in the school. Uh, and we take the kids to DC. Uh, we've done it for five years now. And even when you have, you know, 100 kids in that shrine, that low-lit, quiet shrine, the kids are quieter. They're, they get it. They get that there's something special about being in there. They, don't, they may not always know why, and I have to always refrain from kind of being like the obnoxious know-it-all, like, come and see the Declaration, come see. Uh, although last year, um, there was a school group nearby, and I heard one kid say of me, hey, that guy knows what he's talking about. Let's go listen to him. But the kids kind of get where they are. They realize there's something very special about that shrine and about the fact that these are on display. Um, and I think that says something. It says, says yeah, something to I me. I agree with you. I, I, it, it, there's so much we could talk about with all this. I keep, I keep having ideas that are new to me, uh, that, and that's always fun to be stimulated by your, your, your remarks and your, your work. Um, and I, I was thinking about the, uh, you know, the, 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 it's not an accident of history, but the, the, the Gettysburg Address is key to incorporating the Declaration of Independence into the Constitution. The Declaration of Independence is just an act of Congress. It's a declaration. It's, it's not a legal, it's, you know, it's, it's a legal document in the sense of it declares independence, but uh, it's the Gettysburg Address that embraces it and makes it a, a, what it is today. Uh, and, and Roosevelt's, um, Roosevelt's push for a, a monument to Jefferson uh, part of that was political. There were no monuments to any Democrats in Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, there was the Washington Monument uh, and, and the Lincoln Memorial. So Jefferson thought we should have that. And, but it also has to do with Jefferson's writing, his words, the Declaration, uh, the other things that are venerated in that memorial. Uh, and then even Truman, uh, Roosevelt with, with all that, but then Truman, with his role in getting the editing project started <laughs> in 1950 when the first volume of the Jefferson Papers appeared, um, but also the strengthening of the National Archives uh, and the decision to move those documents down. Uh, Roosevelt had something, I mean, Truman had something to do with that. But we, we, we've, uh, we're talking about things that it's obvious there's interest in in the audience because several of our questions, uh, I think we've just answered, uh, some of them anyway, uh, but there are a couple that I'd like to, uh, to ask. I mean, there was a, uh, how much do you think the survival and preservation of the founding documents contributes to a sense of American patriotism and pride? I think we've answered yeah, that. I think you all, you all think a great deal. And it may be the reason for these things to be where they are and protected as they are. Um, <clears throat> I think we've answered this one also. What is the power, well, we've indirectly answered it, but I'll give you a chance to add to it if you want to. What is the power of seeing the, the actual Bill of Rights or other artifacts in person? And is, is that experience different from seeing it digitally? Yeah. I, I think I, actually, so. I'm writing a book yeah. about fakes, frauds, and forgeries now. And, and uh, three words in your titles. I yes. like all that. That's good. <laughs> but um, I've been thinking about that a lot. There, I just read an article in the New York Times about a guy who absolutely believes that um, meticulous copies are just as important, have the same value 
as the real stuff. And I just, I don't get it. I think that there's something about being in the space with an authentic yeah. object yeah. that transports you back in time. Yeah, the question was, you know, what's the power of it? And that's, that's the, the emotional power. The that's emotional the power. power. I think the, the scholarly, uh, I mean, to, to take a digital, <clears throat> you can take a digital copy of a Jefferson letter and uh, through digitization and other kinds of uh, techniques, you can, um, you can uh, uh, something scribbled over. And that's, they, they couldn't erase, but you know, you really could in some ways, but Jefferson would scribble over things so, so heavily you can't read what's down below. Uh, you can digitize that, assign different colors to the different ink, as long as the ink is different. If he did it while he was writing it, no, but if he did it a, a year later or sometime later, the composition of the ink changes and, and you can assign a different color to the two inks and then eliminate one of the colors. And what you do is basically eliminate the, the scribble and you can read the original. So I mean that has power, but that's for getting at what they really are. But the emotional power of seeing and holding. Uh, I, I, I ran an institution in Chicago uh, that owned uh, Jefferson's copy of the Federalist Papers. Uh, one of his original, he had two copies and they had one, Library of Congress has the other. And to, to hold it, and, and look at it. You're holding something he held in his hand, and that's powerful. Uh, that, that connects you with, to Jefferson in a way you can't otherwise. To stand in front of the, the, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, you're seeing something that others looked at as they signed it. I mean, all, all our founders. It has great power to it. Uh, there's a brief question that I'll answer uh, because I think if, you know, if, if people should know that. Someone writes, what is the difference between the Library of Congress and the National Archives? We've been referring to those two institutions. The Library of Congress was established early in our republic. And uh, it, it is a library uh, that in modern times, uh, throughout the 20th century anyway, uh, the copyright law uh, specified that Everything published, everything that was copyrighted, uh, Congress, uh, the Library of Congress got two copies. So it, it's, it's a library in the true sense of being a library of, of everything published or other things from other countries, other books, but also manuscripts. They have all the manuscripts of, uh, of the founding fathers, all the presidents, mo most all of them. Now with the presidential libraries, there's a trend away from that. But they have manuscripts uh, of American history and all kinds, it's just an amazing institution, amazing institution. The National Archives was established to take government records, uh, equally important to, our, to our, the operation of our government and to our culture, but it's government records and those that need to be preserved forever. And I think, I think in your book you say they have take only 5% or something of all the government records produced? Yeah, and I, and I think the other thing I'd add, you're, you're, you're absolutely correct on the distinction between the two, but the other thing I'd add is that the Library of Congress, the, one of the reasons these documents aren't moved to the National Archives, for a long period of time, there was a tw almost a 20 year gap from when they were uh, ordered to do so and to when they finally happened in 1952, uh, is this a tremendous turf battle between the Library of Congress and the National Archives. The Library of Congress is very concerned about losing its two most prestigious documents, the Declaration and the Constitution. They felt Library of Congress staffers felt the Library of Congress would never again uh, reach that level uh, of prestige because those two <coughs> documents were going to be taken from it and displayed um, at the National Archives. And of course, I don't think that happened. I think the Library of Congress is still held in this great esteem. But that's one of the reasons it took so long and in that finally Truman says, you know, it's time to get these on display. And, and that's what happens in December of 1952. And in fact, on Bill of Rights Day, December 15th of 52, is that enshrinement ceremony that Truman presides over at one of Truman's last public uh, events. He's the, he's the lame duck at that point. Ike has been elected in 52 and, and Truman uh, presides over the enshrinement of the documents. Uh, this is something I'd like to ask you and you may want to think about it a little bit before you answer. I, I, I'm not advising you to but you may want to in which case if you do I'll, I'll ask you another, another question while you think about it. But this is a 
says, if you could save one historical American document that has been lost along the way, which one would it be? And what happened to it? Do you have one in mind? Yeah, I mean, I've thought about that question a lot, so I don't need to think right oh, now. Good. Okay, um, good, good. So I think I'd save the Declaration. So the Declaration, the Constitution is the, is the codification of the principles in the Declaration, right? And as I have said many times, I think that second paragraph, that second paragraph is the underpinning of American democracy, American republicanism, small r republicanism, uh, et cetera. And I think, so if I had my, if there's one you have to save, uh, I think that's the one uh, that you would save. The Constitution is a beautiful no, document. The, the question was one that has been lost, that we don't have now, one actual document that, that oh. one historical document Sorry. that is lost that we don't have the original of. That's what, that's the difficulty, I think. Uh, oh, that's the question? No, I agree okay. with you. I yeah. agree. And, well, uh, having the original of the Declaration to me is, I think it's more holy than the Constitution yeah. in terms of the actual document. I would agree with you on that. But if, 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 we, if we know of a document that's, that we know existed at one time and the original is no longer available to us, uh, I can't think of one. I can't, I can't think a, of one. It's a off tough the top question, of my head. yeah, yeah, because, uh, you know, uh, I mean, there, there are lots of uh, Jefferson letters that we can't find that I'd like to have, but are they? Oh, I have a thought. Uh -huh. Please. Um, one thought is Pennsylvania's copy of the Bill of Rights. Well, there we go. Good for you. <laughs> Bring us back. Great segue. Let's talk about that. So, uh, every state gets a copy of the Bill of Rights. Pennsylvania, too. Docketed, stuck <laughs> in a drawer, or some other safe place in the state capitol. Around the turn of the um, 20th century, late 19th century, it disappears. Somebody says it was carried by an, uh, somebody who worked in the archivist, in the archives, um, in a carpet bag. He carpet bagged it to New York where he sold it and it eventually ends up who knows where. The story that I, um, about North Carolina's Bill of Rights started me thinking about what happened to Pennsylvania's. And actually it started the National Constitution Center thinking about that too. <coughs> and they realized that it might have been the one that is owned by the, the New York Public Library. There's a copy of the Constitution, of the uh, Bill of Rights that's owned by the, the New York Public Library. We know it's not New York. And where is it right this minute? Right down the, you can both guys it's, go it's see It's across it. the hall. Across the you hall. should go look at it. Mm -hmm. yeah. They know it's not New York's copy because New York's copy um, was uh, destroyed in a fire. So whose copy is it? New York Public Library, New York Transportation, um, Transport of Philadelphia's copy. So what the National Constitution did, which was very clever, was instead of saying, New York, give us back our copy of the Bill of Rights, they negotiated a very gentle sharing which doesn't, which, where the um, agreement is that the document stays for three years at the New York Public Library and then stays for three years in Pennsylvania. And nobody talks about who owns it. Except you can. Except I can because, because <coughs> I, I can, I mean, I'm an author, I can say anything I want. But I'm also, um, the, I was just appointed by Governor Wolf as the chair of the Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission. So that document is ours. <laughs> <laughs> great, 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 great. Now it's yours. <laughs> well, and, and it, it, when you see the Bill of Rights, uh, Pennsylvania's copy of the Bill of Rights uh, owned by New York Public Library, uh, in the other room, you will see uh, one of the questions was, in, in, in this age, what steps are being made to preserve our documents? Uh, you'll see a, 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 an elaborate, uh, state-of-the-art, the most modern 
storage facility for such a document, especially if it's going to be put on display. Uh, so that's, that will tell you what is being done. The, the, and also the veneration. I, I think uh, it, it reinforces what Nancy's written about with the North Carolina Bill of Rights and what Steve has written about, about the other uh, the, the charter documents. Uh, that is uh, how we hold them in such esteem that we go to the links that you can see in the other room or in Washington at the National Archives when you go down there. Uh, I, I regret to say that our time is up. I think we could go on for an, uh, at least another half hour, if not more. Um, there is a book signing. Uh, the, Steve and Nancy would be happy to sign copies of their book in the lobby outside the door. There's going to be about a 15 minute break before the next session uh, begins. Uh, we thank you very much for coming today and for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you both. Thanks. Thank you.